<laughs> well, thanks. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, and I'm going to start off by uh, talking about my first meeting that I can recall with Jaden, which was um, at uh, MIT in 1979, January of 1979. Remember any meetings before that? I don't know. But in the famous um, M20 building, which was built after World War II uh, as a kind of demountable that would soon be uh, replaced, but it was still there in 1979. And uh, that's where the linguistics department is located. Uh, there you can see a, a close up of one of the wings of it taken from the window of this uh, building where David and other people uh, that you know were working on the World Wide Dictionary maybe 10 years later. Or so. It has now been torn down, but it's I, I believe. But we had a really exciting workshop there, which was in some ways very similar to this one. It went on for two days, it was focused entirely on Australian languages, whereas this one I think and a few other languages treated. And it was, I believe, organized by David and Nash and Ken Hale. Uh, you can see on the left is the uh, the clean version uh, of the day you know, offered the day before the conference. And here is the, the ones with last minute changes written in by hand. But a remarkable thing about that is that um, of the 14 participants, uh, listed participants there, near, nearly half of them are involved in this event also. Six of them, <laughs> <laughs> which maybe means that the six is good for longevity or that we were all very uh, young at the time. There was, a, <laughs> there was a sense of excitement due to the fact that there's been this huge increase in the amount of work done on Australian languages in the previous decade or so. And a lot of it, the results of a lot of it were still unpublished, but we, um, you know, we, we had a, a sense of great excitement about the data, even approaching it from very different theoretical points of view. We had that, that kind of commonality that comes from looking at the same thing uh, in different ways. And um, so I'm gonna to talk today about uh, a category that didn't come up there. It hadn't been invented yet, at least under this name that is distributed exponents. Um, it, it's quite quite a recent invention, but it's, uh, it's a, I think it's a variation or a specific type of something that's more commonly, uh, that's that been treated more faulty for a longer period of um, multiple exponents and uh, multiple exponents is defined by how about, does she pronounce it in the Spanish way? Caballero, or I don't know if she, she I think she's American actually. Caballero and Harris wrote the kind of foundational piece on uh, most multiple exponents that, uh, that distinguish uh, distributed exponents as a kind of throwaway category that they weren't de uh, dealing with. But here's an example of multiple exponents from, from Botsby, uh, which has got three three feminine uh, uh, suffixes in this sentence. Evidently, she's ripping the dress and dress is feminine. Uh, they're just repeated suffixes with apparently the, the, the same grammatical value. Uh, here's an example from Aurora in the Kimberley region from Mark Clement's grammar of Aurora. Uh, Aurora is big on uh, noun class suffixes, there are four of them, and they usually come after the the, the noun, but in this case, you can put them both ways. Uh, this could be seen as a derivational uh, marker here because this same root widow is also used for men. And so when you put the masculine form on it, it's a, a widower. Um, but in any case, it's third, third person feminine in both. Okay, distributed exponents is like this more general category of multiple exponents in that two or more formatives are involved in the realization of a given grammatical category. You can read uh, uh, Caballero and Harris's definition as to how it differs from multiple exponents, or uh, maybe as a subtype in that no single morphological marker can be truly said to realize a feature or category. A feature is rather realized by a combination of morphemes. And here's an example from, uh, a, from, uh, from Men, a South Virginia language, which the whole yam family that men wants to abounds in distributed exponents and that's so it's not accidental that uh, um, some of the recent studies the most comprehensive studies have come from there especially from matthew carroll um so you can see and this is also a kind of typical south mcginney feature there are no positive specifications uh involved in the marking of plural there's only non-dual and non-singular 
uh, but when you combine those two here, you've got plural, right? So plural is, there is no grammatical category of plural. It's expressed as a combination, non-dual and non-singular. Um, so from, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be exemplifying distributed exponents mainly from Wunaba, a uh, language that I have worked on um, intermittently here uh, in the Southern Kimberleys. Uh, the only, it's related, fairly closely related to Buniandi, written extensively about by Bill McGregor. Uh, so some of the typological features are, are similar. Um, and the, I'll give four examples of distributed exponents in one of uh, One of them is of a kind that's very common, I think in at least uh, non common even Australian languages, probably others as well, you can tell me, but the, uh, the dual, uh, dual number is, um, is marked as a, as a kind of subcategory of, of a not more basic non-singular category. So this one just means they said or did, but when you add this dual suffix, the, uh, it, it means they too said or did. Now, you might say that this is simply, uh, you know, a kind of a, mono, a single place marking of, of dual, but in fact, you can't use this dual marker except in combination with the non-singular prefix. So I consider that to be a form of distributed exponent, but very widespread around uh, uh, at least northern languages. The second example is intense mood marking in the verb. Now, I'm not going to go into the segmentation of all these forms, but you can see uh, in a kind of overview from these paradigms that uh, tense mood is expressed by a combination of prefixes and suffixes. So you can see that uh, in, a, in, in the suffix area, the, uh, all, of these, um, all of these forms of the, the verb for uh, to say or do uh, ma in the, uh, in the past have a, have a marker e on them, which displaces the vowel of ma. But that's not just a past tense marker, it's a past indicative marker. And similarly, the, uh, the, the prefixes are past indicative prefixes. They're, they're unique to those, uh, to those uh, tense moves. And the same goes, okay, you can, you can see that in the contrast between past and present indicative. Now here is a segmented uh, for some segmented examples from uh, another um, tense mood, namely Irealis. And here you've got, um, uh, again, um, tense and mood being expressed in this, uh, in this um, suffix and, uh, and uh, actually in the prefix too, right, in, included in that morphine. Um, uh, here's here's the, the same thing going on with, with different morphology, with different formatives in, in a different a verb of a different class, a transitive verb, uh, uh, rough. And um, there you've got uh, the same thing happening. It, it tends and move distributed across um, prefixes and suffixes. But uh, so if you compare the, the, the interesting thing about this. The, the formative that occurs in the present irrealis here is that it's exactly of the same form as the one that marks the past in the indicative. See, so uh, me is like he or he, see, uh, he, he, the third person did it, whereas in, in, uh, in the irrealis of suffix of the same form is associated with the present. Uh, now, uh, here's the third example. Uh, uh, has a very unusual so-called clusivity system, inclusive, exclusive, in that it doesn't have, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't really have inclusive versus exclusive distinctions. If you try to force those distinctions on it, uh, you get a, a strange paradigm in that this, this word, nieri, uh, you see, occurs both as dual, uh, which can, it's not marked for inclusivity, uh, I and you or, 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 or I and he, she, um, but that same form is used for plural exclusive. So uh, Bill McGregor um, reanalyzed this in a way that, it's, that makes more sense. That is the, the, what's involved in the non-singular in the first person 
is a distinction that what, between what he calls restricted and unrestricted uh, categories. The, uh, the restricted category uh, that is um, you know, realized by Giddy, um, it, it always includes the speaker and either a uh, either addresses or or non addresses but not both. It can, it can include both. Um, there are nonetheless there are ways of uh, of disambiguating that. And one of them is the suffix, the addition of this suffix way, uh, which when added to niiti, which is otherwise never um, uh, general purpose first person dual, but when you add this suffix way, it can only refer to I and somebody else, not to, to I and you. And this, uh, this suffix again, as in the previous example involving irrealis, uh, present marking in the verb, is weird in that this is not a suffix which ordinarily means dual. It's a suffix like that that uh, that uh, uh, was, that Harold was just talking about. It's the one that's used for like uh, Jane Tupala, right? Um, even though there is a perfectly good dual marker that could be used on there, and it is used on the oblique forms. This is the absolute form. It's used on the oblique forms of the pronoun. So again, what you have is a, a kind of subcategorization affected by bringing in bringing in a morpheme that's used for other things in other in other environments. And here, finally, is an example of interaction between uh, um, one of the tense mode and person number categories. I said that uh, in general, the um, the uh, the suffixes express combinations of tense and mood, but um, they don't vary by person number. But look at this paradigm in the uh, kind of future intentional mode. Um, some of the forms have the bare root for ma again on, on that same verb ma, and so but some of them have a a a, a suffix. Uh, e of the same same one we've seen serving very different functions above, and it's not random. There's a difference in that the um, the forms that are marked by e exclude the speaker. Sorry, they exclude the addressee. So if you look at that, all of the ones that uh, that don't have it that end in ma involve an addressee, uh, whereas the other ones don't. So that is yet another way of disambiguating the relation between restricted uh, uh, first person dual and let's say exclusive first person dual and inclusive first person dual. Because coming at it from the other way as from with the pronouns, what this E does is um, it's, uh, it excludes the address. It excludes the addressee, not the, not the uh, not somebody else. Okay. So um, there are four examples of distributed affluence, uh, exponents in one above. Um, and now I'm going to talk about some typologies, two typologies of this phenomenon. The first and most thorough by Matthew Carroll, who did his PhD, largely focused on the Indian, Indian languages of Southern New Guinea and has gone on to do a postdoc in the Surrey morphology group on it. Um, uh, and he's we've got an article about out, just out uh, on it in the general morphology. But what he does is he posits a, a more general category of verbose exponents, um, which includes uh, various subtypes. And his, his definitions of all these things are very rigorous and formal, using formal logic, uh, sorry, uh, symbolic logic and, and set theory. Um, but I'm just going to give them in a very uh, uh, try to define them or get, give you an idea how they work in a very loose way. So there's the identity of information type, which is more or less equivalent to mul uh, multiple exponents as we've seen exemplified above. Identity of information. So each of the each of the morphemes involved expresses the, the same category. Um, and uh, second, what he calls subset of information verbose exponent. Uh, exponent. That's in that is um, involving pairs of morphemes, one of which has a more general sense than the other, but includes the other, right? So um, non singular would include dual, but uh, dual uh, 
establishes a kind of subset of meaning within that larger one. And he models it okay, uh, in this way, or diagrams it in this way, based on an example from another New Guinea language, uh, Weepy, which doesn't, it involves, also involves the dual and plural, as in one example, but in a very different way. Uh, in a way, the dual is the more, um, the more, let's say, you might say uh, basic or unmarked category, and they did only, an expression of dual only involves one morpheme, whereas the expression of the plural includes that same morpheme, uh, so including two people, uh, but it also includes uh, this, this other one. Um, so the, the main point is that this involves a, a kind of a subset of information that between the two categories that are, that are involved. And then there's distributed exponents as defined by Carroll uh, uh, in a way that, uh, that uh, involves overlapping sets, but not, uh, not nesting or inclusion of one in another. Um, an example of that would be uh, the, uh, in NEN, the, the marking of person on, uh, well, you can see, it, it's a, NEN has lots of different number morphemes that vary by verb and verb class. But you can see in this one, um, the, uh, the way of, of marking. Um, okay, so here are the, the basic meanings of these categories. Uh, Non-dual versus dual and uh, non-singular versus singular. So the way of marking plural there is um, non-dual, and non-singular. There's a non-dual marker here and the non-singular marker here. You put them together and you've got a plural. Um, now, a, a second typology, uh, riffing on the category of deponent verbs, uh, those which are always, it's always put active in form but passive in meaning. Um, Behrman at all proposed a category of generalized deponents. We have made that a whole volume on this topic, which they define as instances in which morphological forms give the wrong signal about their function. You can see there are examples of that from, from Bunova that I talked about as well. And Evans proposes a new subtype of generalized deponency that he calls distributed deponency. Basically, that means uh, weird stuff going on with at least one of the morphemes and distributed across the one uh, across two or more positions. Uh, you can you can read that uh, definition if you want to uh, ponder it uh, online. Um, so an example of distributed deponency is uh, from this verb in men, which involves um, uh, the, it's actually a four-term number system. There is a basic three-term number system in NEN that we've seen exemplified above, but uh, there's also a four-term system, and this is com it's common across YAM languages, an aerial feature, innovating a fourth, a, a distinction between large plural and small plural, but based on morphemes that it rings in from other, other sources. So here you can see that singular is used for uh, marking uh, the large plural, the singular figures in marking the large plural. So a classic uh, case of a weird uh, use of morphology that doesn't differs from its canonical form. So um, what I want to do now is compare. Okay, here's here are all the Bonova examples that I've considered in uh, categorized in terms of uh, whether they conform to distributed exponents as per Carroll's definition, or subset of uh, exponents as per Carroll's definition. Or uh, and and or distributed deponency according to Evans uh, uh, categories and there seems to be a correlation here in that the one instance of subset of information uh, 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 exponents exponents in Bunaba uh, is does not conform to the distributed exponency whereas uh, the model of, of Evans. Um, Whereas all, all three of the ones that do conform to that model are not subset of information types. And uh, based on that, I offer a concluding typological general, generalization that 
as, uh, distributed exponents in every instance is much more likely to occur in cases like this than in cases like that, cases of subset of information exponents. That's based not only on a rather small number of examples there from Boomba, but the much larger examples of a distributed, uh, I should, of distributed deponent, deponency in NEN that, uh, that Nick discusses in a rather long chapter on, on this topic. Many, many of them, probably about 20 of them, and none of them are capable, none of that distributed deponency type are of this subset of information. So uh, in conclusion, I just want to say, this is a, a, an example of the kind of stuff that we talked about at the MIT seminar all those years ago, and which I think it's got some kind of inherent interest to it, regardless of the theoretical uh, approach that you take to it. And I, Jane has been a marvelous colleague uh, in many ways, and one of them is that she's always interested in conversations like that, which uh, cross uh, all kinds of theoretical boundaries. So that's all. <laughs>